Good afternoon, and welcome to the Heidelberg Engineering Webinar. Uh, my name is Ethan Priel. I am the director of the ophthalmology department at the Moore Institute in Israel. And I would like to share with you this afternoon uh, this presentation, uh, which will outline the preferred imaging modality for identifying laser pointer injuries in children. Now, laser pointer eye injuries in children and ophthalmic imaging, that is not a very common or popular topic. So let's explore that a little bit further. We know that laser pointers are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. They are used primarily for pointing during lectures. Additional uses include astronomy field trips, balloon popping, cat teasing, etc. And on the not so nice side, they're used for distracting and blinding pilots, harassing athletes, harassing drivers. Used, of course, in weaponry. And today we'll discuss how they're involved in eye injuries. A couple of examples from popular media, we can see here that laser pointers are used for distracting and harassing athletes, most likely from the opposing team's fans. And they can be very, very destructive. And if we look at the media as well, we can find that road rage figures in the use of laser pointers. There's this from Oregon a year ago, where a driver blinded a fellow driver with a laser pointer, causing a pileup of cars. Nobody was injured severely, but it was a real mess. If we look at lasers, just to get a little bit of the history of the lasers, uh, Einstein, uh, 100 years ago, laid the foundation for the laser. We introduced the concept. 50 years later, Theodore Maimon developed the first working laser at the Hughes Research Lab. Since then, we've had about 55,000 patents and more involving a laser that have been granted only in the United States. The semiconductor laser was invented in 1962. If we look at the market for such lasers, the global medical laser systems market valued at about $5 billion, expected to, go th to grow threefold by 2022. Uh, this laser. That's a sophisticated heat beam, which we called a laser. Also appears in movies, of course. But in our world, the use of lasers is in medical and eye skin. They use it in some surgeries as a scalpel in cosmetic surgery for removing of tattoos, scars, and hair. It's used by the military, it's used recreationally, it's used educationally as pointers, of course, for scientific communication and surveying, endless, endless applications for lasers. Looking into lasers, we actually are entering kind of a rabbit hole. There are so many applications, but our topic today is the malicious use of lasers and the effect on people's eyes. So in the United States alone, there's been a 13-fold increase in laser pointer incidences between 2005 and 2011. Today, the number is even higher. We want to summarize and move on. They're powerful, helpful tools in many trades and occupations. Laser pointers are all over the place and they're readily available. They're low priced and they're potentially harmful, very harmful, especially to eyes. Which leads us to our topic couple of medical publications, a large UK case series of retinal injuries in children secondary to handheld lasers, published in the AJO in November 2016. 24 eyes, the mean age of the affected children was 12.7 years. Five children were referred as suspected retinal dystrophies. Three patients had severe injuries. The conclusion of this article was that retinal injuries secondary to handheld laser devices may be difficult to diagnose and are likely underreported. And that's where our talk comes in today. A couple of sample cases. A laser was purged on the internet by a child used for toy for popping balloons, burning holes in paper cards, and of course, burning holes in his sister sneakers. He was playing with a laser pointer, making a laser show in front of a mirror. Laser hit his eyes several times. He used a thousand milliwatt laser with an energy level approximately 200 times greater than the threshold for a normal class 3A pointer, which we use in our lectures. It took him two weeks to get to see a doctor. Second case, a little light, slightly older child, 16 years old, 
central blurring. Again, a thousand milliwatt laser, a blue laser, even more dangerous, had it shining into his eye a, year, a week earlier. Visual acuity is 20 over 80. OCT revealed a small macular hole from a week old exposure. A week later, the macular hole got even bigger and the vision dropped. So how do we identify this retinal laser damage? The patients are the first line of defense, if you will. If the injury is minor and to one eye, it can go unnoticed for a while. If it's a mild burn, it can be ignored until it becomes bothersome. If a young patient admits to themselves that they have some laser injury, they might be reluctant to share it with parents or doctors. They feel guilty. If a younger patient, they might not be able to communicate the nature and the severity of the injury. If they're even younger, really young, they might not even remember playing with a laser or having a brother shine into their eyes. So the underreporting is a real problem. Now, once coming to an ophthalmologist, the description of the visual disturbances can be fuzzy. We're talking about young kids usually. They can't really describe what the problem is. They don't see too well. The patient might be unable or reluctant to recount the event which led to this blurry vision. The ophthalmic exam, as we saw in the British case report, might take place weeks after the injury. And some small outer retinal changes are hard to spot. Now, in younger patients, cooperation can be sketchy. And when noticed and documented, some of the injuries can go misdiagnosed for a while, as we saw again in these case reports. Now, ophthalmic exam, once upon a time, was very personal and close, and you'd examine the retina in depth with a handheld ophthalmoscope. But today, we have much more sophisticated methods of documented, documenting any possible retinal laser damage. The tests ordered in such cases would include fundus photography, fluorescent angiography, high-CG angiography, ultrasound, OCT, OCT angiography, red-free, fundus autofluorescence, and more. Now, the obvious and often confusing findings include scars, hemorrhages, pigmentary changes, macular holes, cystoid changes, all of these are part and parcel of possible retinal laser damage to the retina and can, of course, be confused with other sources of injury. So when coming to treat these injuries, you know, many of these actually are self-healing. In any of these cases which self-heal might not even go reported. Treating with steroid surgery, anti-VEGF agents might also be employed. Imaging follow-up mainly with OCT scans. Gross changes and unresolved lesions easy to capture. We have a large macular hole or a severe burn that is very easy to document. So that might not seem to be too mysterious and warranting all this work. The problem with the easy cases is easy to spot and document. Color fundus photography and OCT scans are the most utilized imaging modalities. We have clear disruption of external retinal layers to macular holes and the location of the large injuries in the foveal region may vary. So looking at these clear-cut visible damage cases, both eyes are the same patient showing the sort of the outer retinal layers. In the top case, we have missing portions of lipsoid zone, zone. In the bottom left eye, we can actually see an elevation of the external retinal layers and hyperreflective column, if you will, going from the external to the internal retinal layers all the way to the foveal pit. Now, fluorescent angiography is not very informative in most cases. These small, minute changes in the outer retinal layers don't really register on fluorescent angiography. The normal angiogram is too contrasty to show such faint changes. And delicate findings might be excused as artifacts or within the normal range. There is a chance of documenting or noticing these changes with high magnification images, as we will see. 55 degree angiogram and a 30 degree angiogram don't really offer much, but looking at a high magnification, high resolution image of the fovea, we can see that the foveal avascular zone is not even all around. There might even be some vascular abnormalities. 
And with imagination, you can pretty much come up with some hyperfluorescence, a circular hyperfluorescent lesion in the center of the phobia. So with OCT scans, which comes as no surprise, the scan placement is crucial. And as we see here in this first case, we scan the fovea with a normal 25 scan, fast scan, if you will, and nothing showed up. So the benefits of a well-placed scan cannot be overestimated. Here we have a well-placed scan right in the center of the fovea where nothing was visible on fluorescein, showing us, again, it disrupted external layers right beneath the fovea, the center of the fovea. That is something we missed on the volume scan. And again, if you take this volume scan a cube, if we scan through the macula with a regular average cube, we will miss that disrupted external layer. And here it is, the same case, when we place the scan correctly, we'll notice very obvious punched out part in the external layers of the retina just beneath the fovea. Initial conclusions. These small, minute changes in trophic spots might be missed if scans are not either moved around by hand or acquired as part of a small, tight scan pattern and then scrutinized very carefully. Such scan patterns are best choice for detecting even the smallest changes. So if we're looking at the scan spacing up top, which is about 250 microns apart, we will miss the pathology. Looking at the lower scan, the same patient, looking at a very tightly placed scan pattern, as you'll notice, we will see changes all throughout the retinal layers. So the first conclusion is when suspecting small foveal damage from laser burns, always run a very tight pattern around the fovea. It's possible to use a manual method of moving the scan around, but if you can actually get cooperation well enough established to do a tight scan pattern, that's even better. Now, photographers' images are at the crucial spot. We can get high-quality images from difficult patients. We sometimes have more time to chat with our patients. Children tend to be more comfortable with you, the photographer. Make them very comfortable. Take off your lab coat, be nice, smile at your patients, smile twice at your young patients. And most importantly, before you start the exam, listen to your young patients and also to their parents. It will give you a clue as to what you might be looking for. Once you're aware of this phenomenon of laser point injuries to the fovea, you should be alert whenever a young patient comes in with an unexplained drop in vision. It's often unilateral. It's often within two weeks of, I noticed something but did not want to go to the doctor. If possible, try to gently discuss laser pointers, talk tech with them, show them the laser in the camera, have them use the joystick, get them, have them get comfortable with you in order to try and elicit some more information as to the nature of their injury. And if nothing else, always take dense, high quality, high resolution scan patterns of the foveal region in both eyes. You can scrutinize them later. Sometimes patients come right away. They go to the parents as soon as something is noticed, especially in serious injuries. Often early detection leads to earlier treatment, offering a chance of better recovery. So how do you make a difference? Keep your eyes open and be on the lookout for any unusual patterns, findings, or stories by your young patients. Most healthy children should have healthy looking retinas. Healthy children, especially the active, 50% of them can be adventurous. And eyes in adventure are a very big no-no. So if you come across a young adventurous boy, be on the lookout for any injuries in the retina if they played a laser pointer. Let's look at some case reports. This was a young 10-year-old healthy male seen three days after exposure. Excellent student. Came home from school complaining to parents about the difficulty reading and getting homework done. He arrived at a center 36 hours after playing with a laser. Fluorescein, autofluorescence, infrared, OCT were all ordered. Looking at the fluorescein, it's pretty normal. The phobial, avascular zone, the boundaries are all normal, no disruption of the vascular pattern. OCT, first visit and second visit followed a few weeks later and a month later. We can follow the healing process for this young boy. If we look at the first visit up top, 
a very dramatic representation of the thermal burn to the inner and outer layers of the retina. Three weeks later, already, that first burn sign is missing, and we can see just a mild disruption to the outer retinal layers. As time progressed, the healing process takes place. And just about four months later, we can see here at the bottom image that the RPE and external layers are completely, almost completely healed, and only a mild disruption is present. So from a dramatic image up, up top, we get to an almost completely flat and normal RPE outer segment representation. We have a four-month follow-up, the first and last visit magnified here we can see. And you notice that the images are askew. The eye tracking allows us to follow these young patients even if they don't fix it very well. We can follow and get the exact same location. So we're assured of following the area of injury seen on the top slide, exactly the same location on the bottom slide. Technical note. It's essential to be right on the fovea in order to bring out subtle findings. Small, round, hyperflective dot artifact seen in the center of the fovea pit marks the spot. And again, children's skills make you a better photographer. If you look at these two examples, between the bottom and the top image, you'll notice the bottom seems to be right on the fovea, whereas the top one actually is. You'll notice this little hyperreflective dot right in the center of the foveal pit. Thanks to the placement of the scan at that spot exactly, we can identify from now already the familiar telltale sign of disruptive, disrupted outer retinal layers, which are concomitant with a laser point injury. The bottom scan, on the other hand, which shows us a perfect foveal pit, is not dead on center. We don't see the little black dot in the middle. And of course, we don't see the disrupted outer retinal uh, zones in this scan. Laser pointers give us a very small pinpoint sign of injury. If we are not actually spot on the fovea, we will not record those changes. Another example, normal and abnormal. And again, the bottom scan shows us what seems to be a normal foveal pit with a normal external layer representation. The top scan shows us the telltale black spot at the center of the fovea, and again, the outer retinal layer disruption seen when the scan is placed correctly. Now, as if pointers are not bad enough, there's a collection of other laser-based toys which children have access to. And these are very powerful lasers. And most children do not really uh, obey the rules of not pointing at your eyes or your friend's eyes. These toys are all over the place and actually advertised as toys for kids. These things are potentially dangerous and should be used only under supervision, if at all. So if you look at this damage, I mean, it looks like a smokestack coming out of a cooling tower. And what's happening here, following the laser burn, there's an actual burn in the retina which is undergoing cooling. And with time, as we saw earlier, this burnt area in the outer retinal layers will heal and most signs will be taken away. One more thing. There are other non-medical radiation-induced burns to the retina which might appear in your clinic. Once again, they come with a sketchy story. These, on the other hand, are an older cohort of patients. They usually don't come in wearing business suits, to put them mildly. But the foveal findings look very familiar and very similar to the ones you've seen until now. We're talking about sun gazing. The habit of sun gazing actually has a potential of causing retinal damage very similar to that seen with laser pointer injuries. So it's not a cool thing learn to recognize the imaging findings. They resemble laser pointing burns, often less severe, usually in teens, young adults. And once again, really listening to your patients is very helpful in outlining the possible source of injury. So this is three weeks following a sun gazing session. Looks almost identical to those damages seen with laser pointers. 
And again, notice that we have placed our scan right at the center of the fovea, hence the telltale dot, which is the artifact in the middle of the foveal pit, when your scanner is placed right in the middle of the fovea. And again, three days, both eyes, in this case, one eye has a larger disrupted area than the other, but we'll see these images look almost identical to the ones seen with laser pointers. So to summarize, retinal laser point injuries can be tricky to diagnose and document. Our young patients might be reluctant to admit the cause. Minute outer retinal changes are hard to spot, especially the distance from the causative event. Children pose extra cooperational challenges. To begin with, they don't tell a complete story. They might have forgotten it or might be a little loath to share the cause of their damaged eyesight. The solution is high magnification on fovea, dense OCT scan patterns, which is the best approach. This approach ensures us to document even the smallest changes in the fovea for further, even actual after the photography review and diagnosis. So, Laser pointers, well, some might say not our style. Not that we're going to point at anybody, but you'll notice that there's humor in this as well. So be careful with your laser pointers. Thank you very much for your attention.